Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our program today, September Garden Chores. We are coming to you from the beautiful central branch of the Darty County Public Library. And now that it's almost September, it's time to start some more garden chores. Did you have a summer garden this year? I hope you did. We did at my house. We had tomatoes, peppers. In fact, they're still making. And we also had some squash, which is, of course, not still making. But it's time to start cleaning up all those garden beds that's not making anymore or your containers. If you had above ground containers using those, which we did, um, you know, it's just time to start cleaning up. So let's get started talking about our September garden chores. You know, there's a lot to do this time of year. It is cleanup time. We need to remove the weeds that may have sprouted, all your other debris like leaves, twigs, sticks, those dead plants, containers that you might not be using anymore till next spring. Get those out. Dump out the dirt or the soil or the growing medium, whatever you want to call it, into a special place. Don't just, you know, dump it out because you can reuse that soil. Yes, you can. And if you're an in-ground gardener, go ahead and once you get everything cleaned up, rake the soil real good and turn your soil to get ready for your next garden. And now's the time to correct any soil deficiencies you may have noticed. You know, healthy soil is crucial for healthy plants. And if you're a composter, your compost needs to be watered during dry periods so that it will remain active. Of course, here lately, we've had quite a bit of rain, haven't we? And if you've planted onions, well, they're nearly ripe. And you know this, when the tips of their leaves turn yellow. And did you know fall? Fall is the time to plant garlic. And I love garlic. And garlic is so good in so many dishes. And it's so good for you. So let's plant some garlic this fall. Have you got your cloves ready? And your sunflower seeds. Did you know they are best dried while still on the plant? And yes, they'll be drying now. Because their season is almost over. And think about this. If you're running out of ideas on where to store your crops, try using a root cellar. You can make your own root cellar. It's not hard. And we'll talk about that another day. And of course, you can always come to the library, find out how to make a root cellar. Or go on our website and find out about root cellars. You know, back when our great-great-grandparents were around, they used root cellars a lot to keep everything ready and fresh for the winter time. Okay, we mentioned correcting soil deficiencies. So let's address that topic now. Soil Amendments and Fixes. Now it's up to you whether you go chemical or organic or both. So we're going to talk about both ways. First, let's talk about organic amendments. You know, you can turn your poor garden soil into a nutrient-rich paradise in which plants will thrive. Now, you may ask, well, what do you mean by soil amendments? What are some great soil amendments? How do you add soil amendments and how much is appropriate? Well, first, let's get a soil test done. Now, you can get some soil tests for free or at a low cost. And this will be your guide when adding fertilizers and amendments to your soil. Too much of a good thing is worse than not enough, so don't overdo it. You don't want to burn those tender crops. 
The idea is to feed the soil, not the plants. And as we said before, healthy soil makes for healthy plants. So where do you get a soil test? Well, you can contact your local county extension office for soil testing information and instructions. Most have websites now. Fees for soil testing along with the proper forms can be found there. The website for the Darty County Extension Service is extension.uga.edu slash county dash offices slash Darty dot html or just google Darty County Georgia Extension Service Office. And you can find listings for all of the Extension Service Offices at extension.uga.edu. Click on County Offices in the top bar to find your local office. And these County Extension Agents, they are trained and they are a gardener's best friend. Now here is a brief overview of some of the best soil amendments for your garden. So get ready with your pens and pencils, paper, your tablet, whatever, and take some notes. So which nutrients do plants need? Well, just like humans, plants need a wide range of nutrients to keep them growing healthy and strong. Soil amendments contain these nutrients in varying amounts and can be used to supplement your garden soil if a nutrient is found to be lacking. Essential plant nutrients include primary nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Aside from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, these are the nutrients used by plants in the greatest amounts. These nutrients help with major functions of the plant including foliage, fruit, root, and flower growth, as well as disease protection. Next, you have your secondary nutrients, magnesium, calcium, and sulfur. These nutrients are needed in lesser amounts, but are just as important to the overall health of the plant. Soil amendments may be used purely to boost these elements. Next, let's talk about micronutrients. Micro meaning small. Nutrients in this category are needed in much smaller amounts than primary and secondary nutrients. Most soil amendments will contain some amount of micronutrients in addition to the main nutrients. Micronutrients include boron, zinc, iron, manganese, chlorine, copper, nickel, and cobalt. And you know, organic soil amendments are a great natural alternative to the chemical fertilizers. But before adding anything to your soil, make sure to have that soil test done to see what's already there. After testing, you'll know exactly which elements you need to add, and that's when your soil amendments come in. Now let's talk about your mineral supplements. Aragonite is a source of calcium that comes from mollusk shells. Since it's low in magnesium, it's good to use if your soil needs calcium but does not need extra magnesium. Too much magnesium can tie up other nutrients, making them unavailable for plants to use. If your pH is low or acidic, aragonite has almost as much sweetening power as limestone. Azomite is a trademark acronym for A to Z minerals, including trace elements. 
mined in Utah is ancient volcanic dust that merged with seawater 30 million years ago. It contains 60 minerals plus that are good for plant growth. Bone char. Bone char is burned bone meal that provides a readily accessible source of phosphorus. Dolomitic limestone will not only raise your soil pH better than pure limestone, it also provides calcium and magnesium. Granite meal. Granite meal is a rock powder that provides slow release potassium and trace minerals without changing the pH of your soil. Green sand. Green sand is high in potassium and iron and has small amounts of magnesium and other trace elements. Green sand is good for loosening clay soils and improving sandy soil. And you know here in this area we've got a lot of clay soils and a lot of sandy soils. So remember, green, green sand. Gypsum. Gypsum is 23% calcium and 17% sulfur. Now this means that it can provide a source of calcium without raising pH levels. It helps improve drainage by aerating the soil, neutralizes plant toxins, and removes sodium from the soil. The sulfur reacts with water to form a weak sulfuric acid that frees up the calcium. So these two work very well together. High kale lime is used to raise the pH and add calcium at the same time. Sulfate of potash contains 51% potassium and 18% sulfur along with trace amounts of calcium and magnesium. It is mined in the Great Salt Lake Desert in Utah. So that's our second one from Utah. Sulpo mag is used when you need magnesium and potassium, but not calcium. It does not raise pH. And finally, zeolites. Zeolites are found in volcanic ash and can improve water and mineral retention in sandy soils. There you go again, something for the sandy soils around here, zeolite. Now we've got some organic nutrient meals. Alfalfa meal. Alfalfa meal is a source of readily available nitrogen for plant growth and also feeds soil organisms. And yes, we do need organisms in our soil. It contains vitamins, folic acid, and trace minerals. Blood meal. Well, that sounds like every vegetarian's nightmare, but it is very high in fast release nitrogen. It also repels deer. And my father, who always had a garden going, except for maybe two months out of the year, loved blood meal. He said it was the go-to for good things. And I had a little dog that loved it too. I had to quit using it because she kept digging up my plants trying to get to the blood meal. And then there's bone meal. Bone meal is used as a source of phosphorus and calcium. Fish meal, an excellent source of nitrogen and potassium. It is a byproduct of fish farming. Knew a lady who loved fish and loved roses. And I know we're talking about vegetables here, but you know, vegetables and flowers love one another and are great together. But she would, um, after she cleaned her fish, she would actually put some of the, let's say, less desirable parts of the fish into her rose garden. 
and she had the most beautiful roses you'd ever seen and smell wonderful of course now she buried the fish it didn't she didn't just spread it out on top of the ground she would bury the fish parts into the garden kelp meal now this is dried ground up seaweed it provides trace of minerals amino acids and enzymes that stimulate plant and root growth and beneficial to soil life. By improving soil structure, it actually helps your soil hold moisture and reduce the effects of drought and frost. Hey, that sounds like a winner, doesn't it? Kelp meal, dried, ground up seaweed. And the last of our meals is soybean meal, which contains high amounts of nitrogen and potassium. They are released slowly as it breaks down. Look for organic sources since most commercially grown soybeans are genetically modified. Hmm. You know, we grow a lot of soybeans around here. I wonder if they're genetically modified probably are to help the farmer grow a better crop and a quicker crop. All right, so we've talked about the, all these different ways to add amendments and fixes to your soil. Now let's talk about composting. That is making your very own fertilizer. How about that? You know, fertilizers can be expensive, even these organic ones, if you go out and buy them. But what if you make your own out of things that you would otherwise throw away? Not only are you making a fertilizer for yourself, saving money, you're not putting as much into the uh, landfills. Sounds like a winner. So what is composting? Well, it is just decomposing organic matter that's all it is it's mainly from fallen leaves grass clippings plant debris and yard waste so when you're cleaning up your garden doing your september chores you could actually start yourself a compost pile if you don't already have one It decomposes into a soil amendment rich in nutrients that will help your plants to grow. Hot or active composting. The best way to produce rich garden humus is to create a hot or active compost pile. It is called hot because it can reach an internal temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. However, 140 degrees Fahrenheit is best and active because it destroys by cooking weed seeds and disease causing organisms. The size of the pile, the ingredients and their arrangements in layers are key to reaching that desired outcome. So the size of a hot compost pile should be a three foot cube at a minimum, but a four foot cube is preferred. The pile will shrink as the ingredients decompose. Consider keeping the contents in place with chicken netting. Wooden sides would be even better to keep the pile contained. Ingredients for your hot or active composting. Well, first you have your browns. These are your high carbon materials. Shredded dry plant matter such as leaves, twigs, woody stems, corn cobs, and cardboard that is the plain type, not the glossy. If your ingredients are dry, moisten before adding to the pile. Fresh greens. High nitrogen green plant matter such as green plants, vegetable refuge, grass clippings, weeds, trimmings, kitchen scraps, 
but no meat, dairy, or fat. These will only encourage animals and insects. Ideally, you want approximately two part browns to one part greens. In reality, achieving the precise mix is hard, but keep that ideal mix in the back of your mind. Please note that shredded leaves, chip wood, and chopped food scraps generally decompose more quickly than whole or large pieces. So the smaller, the quicker it's going to decompose. Now here's how to make your hot active compost pile. Pile the ingredients like a layer cake with carbon materials on the bottom. That's your twigs and woody stems. This will help the air to circulate into the pile. Next, Cover the layer with soil. Then add nitrogen-based materials, followed by more soil. Repeat until the pile reaches two to three feet high. Now go ahead and water the pile at the start and then water periodically. Its consistency should be that of a damp but not wet sponge. Add air to the interior of the pile by punching holes in its sides or by pushing one to two foot lengths of hollow pipe into it. Check the temperature of the pile with a compost thermometer or an old kitchen thermometer. A temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit is desirable. Remember, the 140 degrees Fahrenheit is the most desirable. If you have no heat or insufficient heat, add nitrogen in the form of soft green ingredients or organic fertilizer. Once a week or as soon as the center starts to cool down, turn the pile. Move materials from the center of the pile to the outside. For usable compost in one to three months, turn it every other week. For finished compost within a month, turn it every couple of days. All right, so that's your hot or active composting. Now we have a cold or pa passive composting. Cold or passive composting. So that sounds like less work, doesn't it? And that's exactly what it is. It requires less effort. You essentially let a pile build and decompose using the same type of ingredients as you did with your hot active composting. It requires less effort from the gardener, yet the decom decomposure takes substantially longer, a year or more. So if you're needing your compost quickly as a fertilizer, this is not for you. But Who's to say you can't have more than one compost pile? To cold compost, pile organic materials such as leaves, grass clippings, soil, manures, but no dog, cat, or human waste, please. We're talking here chicken, horse, cow, that type of manure. So pile these up as you find or accumulate them. Bury the kitchen scraps in the center of the pile to detour the insects and animals. Again, avoid adding any meat, dairy, or fat. Also, avoid weeds with this one. The cold compost piles will not reach the high temperatures and will not kill the weed seeds. As a matter of fact, weeds may germinate in your coal pile and no gardener wants weeds. Now here are some more ingredients that are compostable goods. So coffee grounds and loose tea are your best bet. But if you got the tea bags, go ahead and tear them before adding. Dry goods, such as crackers, flour, spices, those can be added. Eggshells, hair, 
you heard me, hair, nutshells, pasta, cooked or uncooked. But remember, we're trying to avoid adding fat. So if you've added oil to your pasta, you might not want to add it to your compost pile. Seaweed. Remember that ground kelp, how good it is for your garden? Well, seaweed is great in your compost pile. And shredded paper or newspaper. But it does need to be shredded. Now, here are some common composting problems and solutions. Avoid soggy piles by alternating wetter ingredients such as fresh grass clippings with drier and more fibrous ingredients such as dry leaves, cardboard, remember not the shiny stuff, or any woodier crop residue. The resulting mix should be damp but not sodden. We don't want it soppy wet as my mom would say. You can also sprinkle wood ash onto your heap, but it must be wood ash and not coal. No charcoal ash, only true wood ash from your fireplace maybe, or a fire pit, but no coals. Again, avoid your co cooked food waste. We don't want that in any animal products or dairy products. Not only will it attract insects, it will attract rats, possums, raccoons. Just don't do it. And if you have a problem with rodents, avoid adding potato peelings because rodents love potato peelings. And avoid dumping your fall leaves into the heap all at once. It'll just slow things down. Add them in modest quantities along with fresh green ingredients. Now, if you want to add weeds, you can, but make sure they have not set seeds. No weeds with seeds. And try to avoid your invasive weeds, such as bindweed. The best thing to do is don't add weeds. Now, if your compost pile starts smelling with that foul, disgusting odor, flip it to introduce more air. Mixing the compost heap not only gives it plenty of air, but it gives it a finer end product that is easier to spread. Now, here are some tips to supercharge your compost. You can tell I'm really excited about compost. It is such a great natural fertilizer at no cost to you, basically, because you were just going to throw this stuff out anyway. All right, let's supercharge our compost. One way is to include ingredients with a very high nitrogen content. Animal manure, animal manure now, such as your chicken, rabbit, ducks, geese, horses, cows, things like that, is powerful at firing up your decomposition. Nettles. This is a herbaceous plant that has jagged leaves covered with fine stinging hairs. It can be found in the woods around here. It's in the woods around my house. But there are another great booster while, get this, urine is also a famous compost activator. Hmm, okay. That's up to you now. I'm, not, I'm just going to leave it at that. So go ahead, get your September garden cleanup done, and start yourself a compost pile. You'll feel great doing it. And if you've already been composting, go ahead and share your tips for your supercharging your compost or the best compost pile you ever had. We'd love to hear from you. All right, we've got the garden cleaned up. We've got the containers cleaned up. We've got our compost pile going. Now what's it time to do? 
it's time to plant your fall garden. And like I stated earlier, it is time to plant garlic. Now you won't have your garlic in the fall, but it's time to go ahead and plant it for your spring. And you know, once you get garlic going, it's just going to keep coming back. So I love garlic. Garlic, onions, celery, and peppers. Those are essential for most dishes in my house. We use a lot of garlic, a lot of onion. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject, aren't I? Okay, we're talking about planting garlic. Fall is traditionally the best time to plant garlic in most regions, and that includes this region. A good rule of thumb is not to plant garlic until after your autumn equinox in late September. So just like onions and other plants in the allium family, garlic is sensitive to day length and matures during the longest days of summer. Fall planting just gives it a jump start on the growing season and it will be one of the first things to come up in the garden next spring. And garlic is so easy to grow but good soil preparation is necessary if you want to produce the biggest and best bulbs. They need to be deeply cultivated. They need well-drained, rich soil with a pH of 6.4 to 6.8. You can add two to three inches of compost and well-rotted manure to the bed before planting. So to know what your pH is, go ahead and get that soil test and see if you need to add anything to it. Get your compost active, hot active compost pile going and keep it turned so it's ready when you're needing it to add to your bed. So we can plant some garlic. So you want to probably plant several different varieties just in case one does not work well in your garden. You want to separate the cloves no more than 48 hours before planting to keep them from drying out. The larger the cloves, the bigger the bulbs. Plant individual cloves, peels intact with the pointy end up two inches deep and six inches apart. Now once you get them all planted, get the soil all around them and they're nice and cozy, you want to mulch them with five to eight inches deep of seedless straw. It will pack down over the winter to about two inches by spring and help keep the weeds down during the growing season. Your garlic will form roots but little or no top growth before the ground feet freezes solid. Not that our ground freezes solid around here very often, but you know, every once in a while we do have a few days of really cold weather. Then early next spring, so we're talking, you know, maybe late February, early March, middle of March, your garlic will be ready to grow. It'll start sending up tiny little green shoots as soon as the ground is thawed and ready for crops to come up. Now you want to feed your garlic plants every other week with a liquid fish emulsion fertilizer from the time the shoots emerge in early spring until about June 1st. Now water is critical during the bulb forming stage in early summer so try for an inch a week and make sure to include rainfall in that inch. About four weeks prior to harvest, the outer wrappings on the garlic bulbs will start to dry, so stop watering in July. Too much water at that stage can stain the wrapper or even cause mold. Don't want no moldy garlic. So then we're going to harvest our garlic around the end of July or early August. And it'll be when the lower third to half of the leaves have turned brown and wilted. But the upper ones will still be green. 
Now to store your garlic, you can hang it in bunches just like you do onions. Hang them in a cool, dry, well-ventilated well area that's shady. Don't want the sun shining on them for three to four weeks to cook, cure. And then after the outer wrappings are completely dry, brush off any loose soil, trim the roots, and cut the tops back to an inch or two above the bulb. All right, and make sure to save your biggest cloves to replant next year. Old timers say that garlic learns because it adapts to your growing conditions and improves each year. So go ahead, plant some garlic this fall and keep it going. And you know there's plenty of other fall crops we enjoy, especially right here in South Georgia. Beets, broccoli, cabbage, collards, oh I love collards, mustard, turnips, spinach, you know all those greens. Not to men mention radishes and onions. You know some folks even plant potatoes this time of year. Now, if you haven't already started seeds and have seedlings coming up, it'll probably be best to buy your vegetable plants and just transplant them into your fall garden. But before you transplant, be sure to harden off the tender plants by placing them in a protected area outside for a few days and nights. So for more information on your fall vegetable garden or any other type of gardens, visit the UGA Extension Service website. Again, the website is extension.uga.edu. There you will find extensive information on your vegetable gardens or your other any other type of garden. And remember, we want to plant flowers and maybe even herbs with our vegetable gardens. Got to have those flowers to bring about those bees and butterflies for, crop, for our pollination. Need that pollination. But there at the website, again I got a little off track didn't I? <laughs> there at your extension.uga.edu website, they also have garden planning guides available and this helps you with knowing what to plant when. And all of this is a service from the uh, University of Georgia and is a part of the County Extension Program Service. Again, if you have questions, contact your local county agent. He can also, or she, can also help you with your soil test and any other things you might need to know. So fall vegetable gardens, they are a great source of fresh vegetables and economic as well. Small, medium, or large, the garden size is entirely up to you. And remember, you can mix it. You can have container gardening and in-ground gardening. Maybe have some of those things that you like to grab quickly in containers closer to your door. It's up to you. Plan your garden. Enjoy the fruits of your labor. It's good for you and it'll put a smile on your face. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that some of these tips and information has been beneficial to you and will inspire you to get out there and garden. If you have any questions, you can always email me at cgoza at docolib.org. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, or if I can't answer them, I'll find the answers for you. Don't forget about the website I mentioned. It's free, it's good, it's beneficial. Come see us. Uh, we're gearing up for September. September is Library Card Sign-Up Month. If you don't already have a library card, come see us. We'll be happy to help you get one. And we've got all kinds of gardening books. Just about any kind of garden and how to make your garden better. 
Thank you for joining us. Everyone go out and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye, everybody.